I consider myself to be a logical person as well as a spiritual person. I would like to know if you've ever had a mystical experience before in your life. And if you have not, what is your opinion about such things? That is from Jordan. Yo, hey, Jordan, how you doing tonight? Very good. Before you answer my question, can I say something? I think you just did. Yes, you can right. say even more if you Smart want. Smart Alec. <laughs> I I would like to say that I I really respect you. Like I I I look up to you a lot and uh I I have a philosophy podcast as well. And uh from watching you it's it, it's inspired me to to create this thing that I'm creating right now. And uh I just wanted to say that like like a, your your philosophical heroes are kind of your your father figure a little bit in life. And, and I want to say that I, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. Well, thank you. Uh, um, I really appreciate that. It's very, very kind. First, of course, we must start with our definitions, uh, which is what do you mean by a mystical experience? A mystical experience. So um, what I mean by that is it, my spirituality is 100% based off of my experience of life. I, 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 I'm not basing my spirituality off of any books that anybody's written or anything like that. My spiritual spirituality is based off of mostly my psychedelic experiences, which I started uh, taking mushrooms for the first time when I was uh, 20, 21 years old. And before that, I was a very rational and hard-headed and skeptical scientific person. And uh, upon taking psychedelics for the first time, it made me realize that I really didn't know fuck all about reality. And to say mystical for me is fully embracing the mystery of the universe. You know, we the only question that science can answer is why, why the fuck all of this is happening. They can say the who, what, where, when and how, but they can't say the why all of this is happening and i've had a lot of mystical experiences from the psychedelic drugs that i've done all right and uh, can you share with me some philosophical insight that you have received while on drugs that you have validated with reason and evidence later because you know scientists do this as well right scientists uh, i don't know if they take drugs but they have visions right the structure of the carbon atom was some guy had a dream about a snake eating its own tail you know they get inspiration well, but then they go through the process of validating it afterwards with reason and evidence so can you give me some knowledge that mysticism led you towards that um that you later validated didn't just sort of have and sit with and simmer because that's not really translating it to, to truth value. Well, even uh, yesterday was uh, September uh, 19th, and that is the the, the day that... You what now? Hang on. Oh, sorry, not September. I don't know how many drugs April, you've done. A April 19th. But it was not September 19th, yes. otherwise I'm about to have a birthday. Uh, April 19th, you mean, April right? April 19th uh, was the day that Albert Hoffman discovered uh, LSD. And today is uh, International Marijuana Day, which is an uh, important day to me because I consider myself a libertarian and, uh, and a sovereign individual that is allowed to put anything that I want to in my body. Uh, but Francis Crick uh, discovered the, the helical structure, structure of... Uh, double helix. Watson and Crick, double helix structure. By the way, I think James... Uh, I think... I think um... It was either Watson or Crick wrote a book about called the Double Helix, which is a great uh, a great read. But anyway, go on. Um, yeah. So it, so it, if if I can, like um, one thing inside of the the psychedelic world, one one way that mainstream media dismisses the psychedelic experiences, they call it a hallucination. You've heard that before, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. In the same way that, that dreams at night could be considered a hallucination, right? So it, what I've learned from my experiences is that we we live in a universe of ever-expanding and complexifying chemical compositions. And I don't understand why one chemical composition has the right to call another chemical composition a hallucination. It, it negates uh, the experience that the person had and... 
what we call reality and what we define as reality is really just the most common chemical composition that all of us are experiencing on a daily basis. Would you agree with Wait, that? Okay, okay. No, God, no. No? <laughs> no why why don't you agree close. with that? Not even close. Explain um, to me why, please. Okay, let, let's just start with dreams because I've never taken any mind-altering substances other than philosophy. When you dream, Sorry? the the pineal gland inside of your brain is producing dimethyltryptamine. So every dream that you have, you are taking a drug, which is a a a tea. Okay, that I, that's fine. That's fine. But I haven't taken that drug. It's naturally produced within me. It's so in so a dream. Are, are you saying that? we have no right to call dreams at night subjective experiences. Well, reality in and of itself is a subjective experience. So our interpretation of reality is no. also subjective. No, 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 no. Why? No, it's not. Well, so for instance, if I dream that I'm flying on an elephant over the savannah of yeah. Africa. That's a good dream. Okay, it's a good dream. So if I'm dreaming that, I can mount a camera to look at my, my bed, and the whole night I'm not moving, or at least I'm certainly not flying on an elephant over the savanna, right? So that oh, I can have someone watch me. Did you? Did I go to Africa? Nope, still in Canada. Okay, Damn. so let's let's right, say so, that so we can you sorry also... we can externally validate stuff that that we know whether it's a subjective or objective experience. Whereas on the other hand, if I am actually not flying on an elephant because you can't, but let's say I'm flying on a, an airplane. Uh, a Cessna or something and flying over and I've got video and and I remember it and I booked the trip and I got there and you know I, I got pictures and people were there with me who remember the experience okay well that's different than what happens you know if I, if I dream that I'm having dinner with my wife and I wake up in the morning and she says I dreamed that I was with uh, you know Raul the Spanish abd cleaner uh, then you know I wasn't with my wife because she was okay not can I afraid. retaliate to that you you believe in such a thing as forgetfulness, do you not? Do you mean, do I think that people have the capacity to forget things? Yes. Sure. I'm, I'm, so of course. could it be possible that while you're in the dream world, you set up that camera as well, but going through the process of waking up, that that reality became non-existent as you entered this reality and the camera footage would not be possible to show anybody else. I don't understand that. Can you step me through that? Maybe I just haven't taken the right stuff, but I don't know what you're yeah, talking yeah. about. No, for sure. I honestly, like, I, I'm not trying to convince you of anything. Like I, I no, 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 it, let's it, just, you, don't give me, don't give me the commentary. Just get, just re-explain it. I, okay. you just give me the straight up. So you have a, 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 let's say you're wearing a GoPro all day today. Yeah. And uh, as soon as you go to sleep, that that GoPro that you're wearing is not in the same dimension or the, the non-physical world as what you went to sleep in. And you turn your wait, GoPro. Wait, no, go see that? Wait, 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 wait. You you, no, no, I don't GoPro understand this part. I don't mean to interrupt people, but I don't understand this part. So if I don't understand the beginning, there's not much point going on. So point. I'm wearing a GoPro yeah. during the day. Yeah. I go to sleep. I still have the GoPro on? You still have the GoPro on. And then what does it do? Shimmers out into another All dimension? Right. I, I got to give you a little side example of what I've learned from psychedelics to explain this next part, if I can. Okay, but we're now layering things, so are, it's going to get progressively layered. more this confusing, is, but go on. It's a very complicated subject because you've never taken drugs or it's before, not, and I have. Or it's not, and it's a hallucination, but, but go ahead. It, or it's a hallucination, for sure. So you and me both know that we see... Uh, smell, taste, perceive 1% uh, of the electromagnetic spectrum of light. Well, you can't taste light, but um, you said... Regardless, taste, your uh, interpretation of reality is completely based off of what your senses can interpret of reality. We can't see all of reality, but that doesn't mean that what we can, that, that what we can see is invalid, right? So... With that 1% that, that science has based this figure off of is based off of what our machines can interpret, which uh, they could also be seeing 1% of reality. And what I'm saying, and this is a very large claim, and I, I understand if you want to agree with this, is that into the 
infrareds and the ultraviolets is that there are par parallel realities with parallel experiences. And because our senses are limited to our experience and our scale and our size, we are not interpreting those versions of reality. They are like- Wait, wait, hang on. Are you saying that the infrared spectrum is another reality? Well, it, below the infrared is an infinite amount of colors that we have no interpretation of because our senses are not attuned to that vibe. The same way a radio, when it's tuning into a radio station, it can pick up that radio station, but the other radio stations that exist, you're not tuning into because the chemical composition of your brain and of your body is not fully uh, attuned to these alternate realities that are playing out in every moment as as we talk right now even. Okay, you, you've got to find some way to answer me stuff that that's actually an answer rather than an analogy that doesn't advance my knowledge at all. Okay. Um, like if I say, uh, hey, hey man, I want to teach you about a habunga jiga. And you say, well, what's a habunga jigger? I said, well, it's an alternate dimension that phases in and out of this, that, and the other. And it's like a radio and it's like, not telling me anything, just draping a bunch okay. of incomprehensible analogies yeah, around yeah. something I don't understand. Let's um, go back to the GoPro that vanishes into another dimension when I go to sleep. Sure. What you, okay, so go, go ahead, because you were supposed to explain that to me, and then we went to infrared, and I don't know what the hell was going on well, with radios. But the, so, so explain to me the GoPro that, that goes into another dimension? Well, the, the GoPro doesn't go into another dimension. You're, the GoPro exists in this dimension only, in this physical form of reality that we perceive. Like our, our, our body is 99.99% empty space, but because of our senses, we perceive it as though there's physical matter in front of us. There's, there's about the same amount of space between every atom in our body as there is every star system in the universe. But because we're at the scale that we're at, and because we're at the, the sensual perception that we're at, we perceive it as though I'm sitting on my fucking couch in and you're sitting or you're in front of your- Oh man, in, in how did I know it was- I just yeah. knew it was. Oh, How yes. come I knew you were on the West Coast? Yes, All right. Yes, yes. So, so you're still not explaining anything. Now we're talking about atoms and star systems. Yes. I mean, you're still not explaining anything to me. Well, what what the fuck happens with the what GoPro is, when I go to sleep? Just try and focus, man. Okay. What I am explaining is that our, our perception of reality is not the complete reception of reality. And when you go to sleep, you're not experiencing something that's fake. You're experiencing a different version of reality. You're experiencing a different understanding of perception of what the human experience is. Okay, okay. Now, if you define reality as anything we experience, well, sure. But that's not the definition of reality. What is reality the is the of objective reality? medium we all share, and that is not the case with dreams. What? With dreams, I dream I'm doing things, but I'm not actually moving. I dream I'm interacting with people who aren't actually there objectively in reality. So you can redefine reality to say, well, anything you experience objectively is reality, but that is not the definition of what reality okay, is. And that's, so, the difference, so that's the difference between a subjective experience and an objective fact. I, other than what you perceive inside of your mind, uh, what is the difference between a dream where you you think that you're talking to me on this podcast in a dream and you're thinking that you are talking to me on this podcast inside of the way? Objective evidence. Objective evidence. Right, which is that is, hang on, hang on. Objective uh, evidence, which means... Did like Mike's Mike's listening to this call? Uh, other people are going to listen to this call. You know, hundreds of thousands or millions of people are going to listen to the call. No pressure. <laughs> We're going to listen to this call. Okay, it's so recorded. It's have, uploaded. Have, other people are going to write in. Like nobody ever writes in and says, "Hey, Steph, you know that dream you had about flying over the savannah, uh, whatever it is that I dreamed about." Nobody ever writes in and says, "I really want to discuss your dream." Why? Because they weren't there. But when you and I have this conversation and record it and put it out there, people will experience it. What we saying and they'll write in with questions and maybe they'll call in with follow-ups and so on so there's other people out there and an objective record of what we're doing which never happens with my dreams if i don't tell someone about a dream they'll never know what it was but you also agree that forgetfulness exists and possibly you could be forgetting that's happening in the dream world 
forgetting what's happening in the dream world. Well, the same verification that's happening right now. Oh, so every single dream I'm having could be existing and, and objectively put out there in the universe, but I'm forgetting it every single time, even though I have like five dreams a night. Yeah. And I have had those dreams. You know, I, the first dream I remember having was when oh, I was two years I old. I want to ask you a question. So I've had, hang on, I've had hundreds of thousands or tens of hundreds of thousands of dreams, and they're just as objective as this podcast, but for hundreds of thousands of times, I and everyone else has completely forgotten that they've existed in some objective form. Yes, and vice versa. On okay, that is not possible. There. No, that's not possible. Okay, so that's fair enough. Because there's forgetfulness, and then there's something which is no null hypothesis. Um, have you ever done any drug before? No. Like, uh, like even like, uh, like you had surgery and and uh, or like. Oh yeah, no, I was, I was knocked out for my out. throat surgery. Yeah, I was knocked out for my throat surgery. Did, uh, was it the kind of experience where, where you could feel like a, a different experience of reality than you are normally used to feeling? Yeah, I passed out. Okay, so I, I want to give you an example of a, tr of a, a trip that I had on, uh, on ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is a South American tea that is ba based off of dimethyltryptamine. Same endogenous chemical that ha uh, your your pineal gland your third eye excretes into your brain when you dream i i've experienced the dream world in the waking reality and this is why com i've come to this conclusion okay so i'd like to give you an example of a trip that i had wait so you're talking about stimulating the dream center or the dream chemical in your brain while you're awake yeah, so you can call it the dream chemical, chemical, but every... No, you called it the dream chemical. You called a okay. chemical that is released when you're dreaming at night. I'll call it the dream chemical, but what it really is is just a chemical. It's just a different chemical. But it's that a chemical that reproduces what happens when you dream. Yes, and also when you die... And so it's a dream <laughs> chemical. Let's, let's, let's just be frank but with our... Also, I'm not trying to trick you also, here. It's a, it's a chemical that's released the same as when you dream. It's a dream chemical. It's also a chemical that's in a plant that has been inside of a tradition in South America for it, probably as long as humanity has existed. So here, here's an example of what, what the scientific world would call a hallucination that I have. And a hallucination sounds like... I'm watching Bart Simpson riding a fucking horse while Michelle Obama is sucking it off or something like that, you know? It's well, I, I can't think that anyone else would describe a hallucination in that kind of vivid <laughs> detail. You may be revealing a little bit more of yourself than you care to admit, but yeah, go on. I really want to suck off a horse is what I'm getting at. But hey, I'll give you an example of a trip that I had. Like, I, I went to South America and studied shamanism for a period of time, and I came back, started making the medicine for myself. And uh, it, I, I had this trip, and I, I want to say, first and foremost, all of this trip is inside of my mind. It is inside of my mind. It is, it is completely centralized to my mind. It is not a parallel reality outside of my mind, but my mind is fucking huge. So here's the trip that I had. I, I uh, drank this medicine, and... Uh, I, I saw this like wall of moving shapes and images that passed by my body. And then all of a sudden I was inside of a laboratory where there was these uh, praying mantis machine scientists that were wearing lab coats. <laughs> I, I know how ridiculous it sounds. And uh, they, were, they were building devices and, and technology inside of the laboratory. And when I showed up, they looked at me and they're like, okay, like, who's this fucking guy? And I said, hey, what are you guys doing in, uh, in this laboratory here? And they're like, what the fuck does it look like we're doing? We're making devices, machines for... You know, the, the, these, these, these guys in your dream sound a lot like you with the casual swearing. But yes, <laughs> nonetheless, they do. Go on. Yes, they do. Yeah, yeah. They're a, person a personification of my personality. So I, I, they're like, okay, what do you want to know? And I said to them... Uh, I would like for you to show me a free energy device or like how to make a free energy device. And uh, they said, okay, well, we can't show you the blueprints but because you won't understand it. But what we will tell you is if you want to create feed, uh, free energy, you should uh, create a feedback loop of light. And if you know music at all, when you play like a reverb chamber, 
uh, you, you make a sound and the reverb chamber will feed back into itself. And they said to do the exact same thing with light. And the idea that I got off of this, regardless of whether this was real or not real, I, I got some creative idea from this experience that said, you build uh, a pyramid out of, let's say like, you know, like FBI glass where you can see through one way and it reflects back the other way. You've seen a cop yeah. show before, I'm sure. So they said, build a pyramid out of uh, that type of glass so that the light will shine through and reflect inside of itself and create a feedback loop and that will create more energy than you will know what to do with it, which is coincidentally the same way that lasers work. They take uh, a light source and uh, reflect the photons back and forth upon each other until they're excited and then they shoot it out in a certain direction. And this is something... But, they, but to be fair, lasers don't create energy. Well, what do you mean by that? Of course they create energy. They're projecting energy out into the physical... No, no, no. They consume energy. Well, yeah, they consume and they project it. They transfer energy into another form. If you've studied physics before, you know that uh, nothing is ever lost in the universe. It's just transformed into another form of energy. Right. But what I'm saying is that if you have a laser pointer, the battery wears out. It consumes energy. It doesn't produce well, energy. Well, you're missing the point of, like, that was a pretty cool story that I probably couldn't make up. And I'm not a fucking physicist. I don't know anything about free energy. But for some reason, the, the hallucination that I had, it wasn't just some bullshit pattern thing on top of everything uh, with some weird light coloring and stuff like that. I, I w entered into this three-dimensional world that... While I was experiencing it, it felt realer than me talking to you right now. I know what reality sure. feels like, and and I, I experienced this realm, and it felt more real than this experience of life. And I think that is because, uh, and connecting the two points from what I was talking about earlier, is that the dream world is another world, and this world is another world, and somehow when you do psychedelics, and they have uh, MRI scans and brain scans that show when you do them, the part of your brain that interprets the dream world and the part of your brain that interprets the, re uh, the real world that me and you are talking in right now, there's a gland in between those two worlds and that gland shuts off so that information can be passed back and forth. And in a universe of uh, it, that rewards complexity and r rewards uh, connectivity. Our frontal lobe, our neocortex, is the most densely connected thing in the entire world. And doing these psychedelics, doing magic mushrooms, doing ayahuasca, smoking DMT, causes what they call neurogenesis and a, a hyper... Uh, connected brain like uh, there's science that shows this shit right now I'm going out on a limb by making the assumptions that I make I I'm I understand that 114 percent that I'm going out on a limb but I'm also the person inside of our culture that has done more psychedelics than anybody else so I have more experience and more perception of what is actually going on in regards to this this mystery So the point of that story was that you've messed with your perceptions by screwing with your brain's wiring and reproducing in a waking state that which your brain is supposed to reserve for a sleeping state. And that's given you the illusion that you've had some sort of insight or some sort of view into another dimension when all that's happened is you fried your brain a little. Yes, yes. Okay, let's define illusion, though. Go ahead. No, I'm, I'm asking you to define what an illusion is. Oh, it's a subjective experience that you believe a has something to do with objective. Experience. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Oh, Hello. Sorry, I'm sorry. You just asked me a question. Let me answer the goddamn yeah, question. I, I apologize, Stefan. Thank you. All right. So an illusion is something that you think is happening in the outside world, or you're coming to a conclusion about something happening in the external or objective world, which is not borne out by independent verification. So if you're in a desert, you're looking across the sand, you think you're seeing a lake, well, you're just seeing reflected waves 
uh, of of heat and and light going between differently heated layers of the atmosphere. So what you're seeing is true, but the conclusion you come to is you say, ah, that's a lake. But it's an illusion because you're taking your sense data and you're projecting some fact on it, which is not true. You get to the lake and it's just sand and whatever, right? Or, you know, you look at the old thing, you look at a pencil in water and it looks like it's bent a little bit because the water refracts, refracts the light. But it's not bent, right? You can run your finger down and feel that it's not bent. So illusions are things, uh, they, they sort of conclusions that you jump to based upon your sense data that are not borne out by independent or other sense verification. Um, me, me and you are, are both having our, ex, uh, our subjective experience of realities, correct? If we can corroborate our experience with other people, then it's not subjective anymore. If other people can corroborate our experience and be a witness to the experience that me and you are having, then it's not subjective anymore, correct? Well, that's one way of doing it, but there are many other ways of doing it as well. I mean, I can corroborate my own experience, as I just pointed out. I was but there was nobody else in the desert example with. Excuse me, still talking, still talking, still talking, still talking. There was nobody else in the desert example, or in the finger down the uh, running down the pencil in water example. I was then verifying it for myself that my subjective perceptions were not valid. I I didn't understand that. I'm sorry. Well, you said that other people are necessary to verify my experience. Yes. Or, and that's not necessarily true. If Why? I film myself sleeping, it's, I can review the footage for myself and find out if I was flying on an elephant over the African savanna. I can also, if I think that there is, you know, in the hot days, you, you think that there's all these puddles of water um, on the road because it looks, the, the little mirage is going on on the road. As I drive forward, I can see that I'm not splashing through anything, and therefore it was just an illusion. Okay. So we don't actually need other people um, to to verify our subjective experiences. So, so let's say that that GoPro is running again, that camera is videotaping you, but inside of your mind, you're imagining yourself as a child, as something that happened to you as a child, and inside of your mind, there is an experience happening. You are reliving an experience that you had, but the GoPro isn't going to capture any of that because it's on this plane of reality, right? The, the GoPro can't see you fishing through your memories and your ideas. Yes, but why is me fishing through my memories and ideas not part of reality? I'm doing it well, a, with yeah, a real brain. Still talking, still talking. I'm doing this with a real brain in the real world using real biochemical processes, uh, so I don't know why we need another dimension for me to be reflecting upon my memories. Well, it, we don't we don't need one whatsoever. Like like if I like one idea that I've been meditating a lot lately is the idea of infinity. And and I'm very fond of the idea of the infinite. And if you really take that idea and swallow it and shit it out, it, it what it really means is that every possible reality is happening simultaneously. Like Plato said that time is the moving image of reality. And the reason he said that is because Plato was fucking doing drugs. They went to the Eleusinian mystery schools and they took ergot and all of them were tripping balls. And that's why they had the philosophical breakthroughs that they had at that time is because they were experiencing themselves outside of the the consensus reality that they have. When he said time is the moving image of eternity, he he gained that perspective. Wait, wait, wait. You, you just changed it. Hang on. Sorry. You just changed the quote. Time is the moving image of eternity. He gained that no, perspective. No, sorry, sorry. Just to interrupt. The first time you said time is the moving image of reality. Okay, sorry. I'm just I, confused I, about which I apologize. Time is the moving in, image of eternity. And he experienced that because he became eternity in the moment. And all of this stuff, we can argue all of these points to the death, no matter what. But unless you're willing to sacrifice 10 minutes of your life to smoke dimethyltryptamine and experience the alternate reality, we don't, like, there's, there's not a lot of common ground for us to talk to. Because I think if you uh, found the courage to, to look for that drug and take 10 minutes out of your day to smoke it, you would start to understand what I'm talking about. There's nobody that's done this drug, this medicine, these medicines that have been used by human beings since the beginning of human beingness 
that would disagree with any of this stuff because it opens you up to the fact that all of this shit is a huge fucking mystery and and to say that you know the truth is like like sucking on a pacifier for the infantile mind none of us knows anything that's true whatsoever wait sorry none of us knows anything that's true is that a true statement Oh, you got me there. Okay, here, here, here's. And also, did you just refer to me as having an infantile mind? Is that how no, you? No, 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 Get people to to appreciate your thoughts. Well, well, well thoughts. When I say infantile, I mean that you haven't experienced all of the facets of reality that exist. You know, I there. I, and, and sorry, and and you have experienced all the facets of reality that exist. No, I've experienced a couple more than you, though. I would say that. And how do you know? that something which directly stimulates subjective hallucinations, which dreams are by any rational or empirical standard, how do you know that that's another reality and not just your brain doing its thing, which is to give you a subjective experience, which it does every night? Because I've shifted my definition of reality and I... No, 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 no. That's not how philosophy works. You got a philosophy show, so I'm talking guy to guy, right? Yep. Thinker to thinker. Yep. You can't, like, how do you know that... What you subjectively experience on these drugs is some kind of alternative reality when you're taking something that directly messes with your perceptions and you know that ahead of time. You're not going in a spaceship and going 2001 yeah. style through some sort of portal. You're taking something which gives you a very vivid subjective experience. Yeah. How do you know that that is any kind of objective reality that you're experiencing? It's not objective. What's, what's the null hypothesis? It's not objective. It's 100% subjective. And from experiencing this thing, I've learned to shift a couple of my definitions of what words mean to me. And I've shifted the word reality to mean what I am experiencing. What I am experiencing is real to me. Whether it's real to you or not, that doesn't matter to me. Reality is what I perceive it to be, and reality right. is what you perceive That's exact, it to be. Exactly what I said at the beginning of this conversation. I said, if you define reality to be that which you happen to be experiencing in the moment, but that's not the definition of reality. That is, you can't just take these two, you, you, okay, do you at least admit that there are subjective experiences in this world, but that have nothing to do with alternative realities? Yes, definitely. Okay, good. So there are subjective experiences in this world have nothing to do with alternative realities. I stub my toe, I feel the pain, you don't. That's a subjective experience. Nothing, I'm, I haven't entered into another reality called pain toe universe, right? Yeah. So there are subjective experience of nothing to do with reality. Do you also admit or at least accept that there are at least some objective experiences that can occur or there is some kind of objective reality that we're sharing at least to the point where we can have this conversation? Yeah, definitely. And that's what, that's what I call the most common chemical composition. Because we're all experiencing the most chem common chemical composition, we share similar definitions of reality. And when you change that chemical composition, and there's been lots of uh, instances where people have taken hallucinogens together and share the alternate reality that they experience as well because they're on a similar vibration, vibrational plane of experience. Okay, I, I don't know what any of that means, but I mean, there are, there are collective um, hallucinations well, to some that. degree, right? There is uh, um, what um, Jung called sort of archetypes or collective unconscious and so on. I mean, a lot of people will dream about uh, flying or, or dreams of things that they're afraid of and so on. So yeah. listen, I mean, there's not really much that I can say because if you're going to make up your own definitions for things, then there's not a philosophical conversation. Um, you're just well, you're using words that that philosophers have worked very hard to turn into something real, and you're just making them your own subjective experiences. Yeah. And, you know, you can you can call uh, a piece of shit a great sandwich. It probably isn't going to taste how you digest it. But um, l let me just ask you this as a whole. Let, well, in because, response to that, if you're going to call me out on that. It, sure. Language over time is constantly morphing and constantly changing, and words are constantly getting redefined over history. There's plenty of examples of, of words that mean completely different things after like a certain amount of generations because people apply new definitions to them. And I'm not trying to... Can you to, give me an example? Uh, well, even in, in, let's say, America, 
in uh, in like once hip hop started getting popular, when somebody said something bad, it meant it was good. Like, oh yeah, you bad rapper, man. You you. Oh, oh look, that's really look sick. Look at that right? bad that bitch. That's good, a, right? a clear example of a word becoming the exact opposite meaning of what it meant before, inside the context of the culture that's experiencing the language itself. And my biggest point for all of this is that. Our reality models are 100% based off of the language that we use to describe them. We, we interpret what's going through our senses and we try to articulate it into language. And these word models define uh, the, the key essences of what our culture becomes. And with these, these parallel realities, these psychedelic trips, there isn't a lot of words that really people can use to describe them with. And, and when you take a psychedelic, it, is, it activates the language center of your brain. There's scientific proof that says that more energy goes to the neocortex, essentially the part that makes you... Do you know who Terrence McKenna is? No, uh, well, I do know who he is, but I just want to get back. So, so your goal as somebody who is interested in philosophy is to say we should stop trying to strive for objective definitions. We should stop trying to tie language as much as possible into objective experience, and we should basically redefine things however we want because – nihilistic rap culture has changed the meaning of some words. <laughs> well, that was one example that I used. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is it's not this or that. I'm saying both of these things are happening, happening simultaneously. The universe in and of itself is a paradox. There's no reason in the Okay, and, I mean, sorry, I got to interrupt you. You're just saying stuff now. I, I got to ask you, though. I mean, this is a, a, a really serious, serious question, right? It's a really serious question, Jordan. Yeah. Do you ever worry that the chemicals that you put into your brain that alter your perception, which we know, right, they, they alter your perceptions and they do give you sort of waking dream states. Do you ever have any doubt or any concern about the stuff that you're saying in terms of it's some alternative objective reality? Like the mysticism that you have, are you ever concerned that you might just be you taking a hammer engine. to a very delicate engine and then saying, well, the engine is just working differently when you break it. I mean, do you ever have any concern that you may just, in fact, be wrecking the machinery of your mind through drug addiction and that all of the stuff that you think makes sense because you've done some harm to your brain only makes sense because you've harmed yourself? It, it's a possibility. It just yes, ever cross your mind. I, I'll answer that with the question. Do you have any concern by not doing that? You're doing the same thing? God, no. No, I don't have any concern that yeah, by, uh, by, by, I, I don't have I any concern, no, you asked me, you asked yeah. me a question. I don't have any concern that by not taking drugs that damage my capacity to perceive things that I'm somehow harming myself. Yeah, and. But so, so I asked you first though, so yeah, answer my question rather answer. than with another question. Do um, you ever have any doubt or any concern or any possibility of a shred that what you're saying might just be a load of garbage that's coming out of somebody who's taken a lot of drugs and harmed their capacity to actually process sense data accurately? Um, I, I, to answer your question, no, I don't feel that way because I used to be a very sick and a very troubled and a very sad person that had a very negative outlook on reality. And by exposing myself to this stuff, I, I, I'm talking a lot about the metaphysical concepts of it, and I haven't talked a lot about the healing properties of it, where they've shown it heals depression, it heals mental disorders, it gives people a more positive pr prospect on reality. And I had a, a very broken mind when I started on this path and I had a lot of resentment and I had a lot of anger and self-doubt and it, it has healed me of all that stuff to where, you know, I can work a full-time job and be a happy person and have a happy relationship. And all of those things that I couldn't do before, it's given me the gift of being able to enjoy my life in such a way that I'm not regretting the past and I'm not having anger towards people that, that harmed me in the past. And I feel like I've bloomed and I've become a, a productive member of society because I've taken these trips that I've taken. All this other stuff on the side is, is what happens after you've done four or five trips, you know? All right. So 
I mean, you understand it's a little paradoxical when you say you can't ever be certain of anything and nothing is true, but I'm absolutely certain that this has not damaged me in any way. So I just want to point out that it's a little bit confusing. But I, what I do want to know is what happened to you before that you said you had a broken mind or you're angry. Oh, I knew you were going right? to get so, so from your, from your childhood, what was going on that you felt you needed healing from? Well, uh, my, my mom, uh, left my dad when I was two and, uh, she, uh, continued to have a bunch of boyfriends and raise us as a single mom. And we moved probably to 30 or 40 different cities before I was in fifth grade. So I never really got a chance to put my roots down and I was kind of neglected. And sorry, how many boyfriends did she have during this I, period? I have no idea. I, 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 well, just roughly. I, I don't know. I was really young. I, I don't remember. But she was moving from city to city to city. Was she moving for guys? Was she? No, why she, were you moving I, so much? I, I think that she was running away from my father because she he was uh, an abusive dude, and she wanted to make sure that he couldn't have uh, a, a contact with us because he had been physically and mentally abusive to her as well as uh, us. And she, it was like a protective mechanism that she was. She doing. was on the run. Yeah, yeah. She was on the run from a dangerous and violent man. Exactly, yeah. And did you know that at the time? Uh, well, I, I feel like my body intrinsically knew that. Like I, I developed like a, a leukemia type blood disease when I was really young and uh, and I felt that, uh, that the tumultuous experience that I was uh, having as a young child and that my mom was having manifested in a form that that made me very sick because there was really no other reason for me to catch that illness. And uh, and I, I recovered. I'm sorry. Sorry. I just want to make sure I understand. So when you were on the rung, how, how old were you when you got this illness? I was two or three years old, I think. Why would there have to be a reason? I mean, sometimes people just get sick, right? No, there's always a reason. There's always a reason. Yes. So nobody ever just gets sick by accident. No. It's, there's always a reason. No, there's always a reason. Okay, so when people get Ebola, like th there's always a reason somebody, for it. There's a reason why one person gets Ebola and someone else doesn't. Somebody gave them Ebola. Well, no, of course. It's always a cause, but the cause is different from a reason. Yeah, they were exposed to that illness at the time. Have you ever uh, been like... No, 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 no. I don't want to get into abstracts. Let's stay with your childhood. I, I was just trying to sort of understand. So you feel that you got this, um, you said a leukemia-type blood illness? I'm yes, not sure what that means, I, but let's just... Uh, I think that illness sorry. can be caused by stress. Uh, 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 oh, yeah, that's certainly true. Yeah, that's certainly... But not all illnesses are caused by stress. Anyway, I mean, people get lung cancer without smoking and... Right, so... Um, so you were... Your mom was on the run and you got sick. And how old were you when you got sick? Two or three. Two or three. Sorry, you mentioned that. And then what happened? I, I don't know, man. I was two or three years old. I don't fucking remember. No, but then what happened? I, my my dad life? gave me a blood transfusion. It put my father's blood back inside of my body and it was it was over after that. Right. And But then what happened in your life as a whole? Uh, well, we settled down and my mom married my stepfather and he was, uh, he's an incredible man. He was a great father to me and, uh, and I developed for the rest of my life. I became a musician and played music for 10 years. And in the last couple of years, I, I've started, uh, doing comedy and doing podcasting and giving lectures about psychedelics. Long story short. And you're, you said you, you full-time job. Um, what, uh, what's your, full, what's your job at the moment? I don't have a full-time job. I pick up work when I can do it because I have a lot of other projects that I'm, I'm working on to try and make my life gain fruition from the, the things that I love rather than working for somebody else. And what happened to your musical career? I mean, uh, it, I, I never made any money off of it. I still make music, but essentially I, I'm 32 now. So I made a decision last year that was, okay, I need to allocate my resources into... Oh, sorry. Sorry to interrupt. W what have you lived on? Well, I've had jobs the entire time. I, I do construction. Um, what kind of jobs do you have? I, I have a furniture company. I build furniture for people. I do uh, uh, PA work in film when I need money and so on and so forth. Uh, production assistant? Yeah. 
Right. Okay, so you, you, you sort of pick up odd jobs from here and there, right? I, I would like to ask you a question if I can. Well, you can, and I'm I'm not I mean perfectly happy to answer. I just want to sort of get a a sense of the shape of your life. So you you sort of you've picked up some odd jobs. You've done some traveling. You've obviously taken a lot of psychedelics. And um, the next thing you want to get into is uh, podcasting. Well, I I have a podcast right now. It's been running for six months and uh, picking up a good following already. Hopefully, this gets me more from it. I would like if that that was a possibility. And uh, I I also uh, do stand up comedy and uh, and play music. Yeah. But right now, what's what's getting you income? Uh, the furniture thing and the production assistant. And uh, I've got a, a moving company that I work for when they need help. And uh, it, potentially I'm going to start like uh, doing like finishing carpentry when they need help as well. I, I like to have a bunch of different jobs that I'm on call for so that I have a certain amount of time to be creative in life. Right. And do you want to settle down, get married, have kids at all in the future? Yeah, definitely. Fuck yeah. I want to have as many kids as my resources can provide for. And how old do you want to be when you have the kids? Oh, it doesn't matter to me. Well, it probably matters a little bit. I mean, you don't want to be 90, right? Uh, yeah. Like uh, within the next uh, 10 to 12 years, I would like to be done making kids. As many as I can pop out in that amount of time that my resources can allocate for. And you, you mentioned a, a relationship. You mean a romantic relationship? Yeah, yeah. I'm in one right now. And how long has that been going on for? Uh, it's been going on for nine, ten months now. And does she want kids? Yeah. And you guys, do you think she might be the one? Uh, yeah, yeah, she is the one. And what does she... Uh, think of your uh, drug use. Uh, she's uh, she, she humors me. She's from an academic background, and uh, and she sees where I'm coming from. And we've started to explore these psychedelic landscapes together. And she's starting to understand more what uh, I was talking about early on in our relationship. And does she do drugs? Yeah, yeah, we do drugs together all the time. And how do you think that would affect your capacity to be a responsible parent? Uh, well, not at all, I, I would guess. I don't know what that means. Do you, mean, you, you think it would be fine to take a lot of drugs when you're a parent? Yeah, I mean, as long as I got a babysitter and I didn't have to take them out of bed while I was halfway through tripping or anything like that. I, I'm a responsible person, you know. Well, I'm not sure that, I mean, if if you think that it's okay to be a parent taking a lot of drugs, I would well, it's question Stephanie, this characterization taken, of responsibility. You've never taken any drugs before, so you have no idea what it's like, though. Like, you're, you're, you're operating from a completely biased view, viewpoint. I don't think hallucinating and being a good parent go hand in hand. I, I don't yeah. think I need to take drugs to are, figure that out. I don't juggle train souls either. That, that doesn't night, mean though? I think it's a good idea. Are you having dreams at night? Because then you're hallucinating. Are you not? But when I wake up, I'm perfectly lucid and able to parent. If my child has some problem or something that happens or they need my attention or need me to drive them somewhere, you can't be taking drugs and be a parent. Well, not, not when you're on, you don't parent them when you're on the drugs. You allocate four hours a week to do the drugs when somebody else is taking care of them. And there's no hangover with mushrooms. You wake up the next day feeling fucking great. You can drive fine. You can take them to school and you can feed them your their breakfast. It's not like doing alcohol or cocaine where you're like hung over for days on end afterwards. You wake up and you feel better than you did the day before. Well, except... I mean, even I don't know if that's true or not. I'm, I take your word for it, but um, except that it does mess with your sense of reality. And my concern is that as a parent, you want to transfer as much reality to your children as possible because that's the medium they're going to actually have to have jobs in and save money in and buy property in or whatever it is that they want to do and drive through. And so I think as a parent, you want to bring as much reality to your children as possible. And I think if you're continually tripping out, 
uh, and you are thinking you're in some alternate dimension, that's going to kind of freak out your kid because either you're going to hide that from your kid, which is a very important part of who you are, or you're going to give them the kind of verbal torrent that you give to me, which is going to destabilize their sense of reality. And I don't know that you have that right to do that to a child. If the child grows up and wants to do it as an adult, well, it's, obviously it's that's no, their... It's no different than me telling them about the sex that me and my wife had last night. It's not for them to know. They're children, and I'm not going to include them in every part of my life. I'm allowed to keep secrets from them until they're old enough to ask me the question of, hey, have you tried this before? Yes. No, no, but that's not what I'm not saying that you would have them stare at you while you take the drugs. What I'm saying is that because taking the drugs has given you the sense that your subjective experience have some sort of otherworldly reality, that metaphysical supposition is going to transfer itself to your kids. Because yes, either you're going to totally. pretend to be somebody who's never taken these drugs, like the way that I would parent, or the drugs, the drugs that you took and would continue to take is going to have an effect on how you describe and provide reality to your child. In other words, they're going to get the effect of your drug use without obviously them taking the drugs. And I don't think that's a fair thing to do to kids. Yeah. I think you want to give them as much reality as humanly possible. If they want to take drugs when they get older, that's their choice. But I don't think you want to give them your metaphysical drug hallucinations as if there's something to do with reality. Well, in in that sense, my definition of reality is different than yours. So I think that by instilling my kids with my understanding of reality, it's going to make them more prosperous than had I not had these experiences because you're instilling your kids with what your perception of reality is and I'm instilling my kids with what my perception of reality is and neither of us know if we're fucking right about it. No, I know that I'm right. <laughs> well, I, I, look, listen, it, I can't do it, this it, for 30 years of... and have worked all the way through metaphysics and epistemology and ethics and politics. I can't have a podcast based upon rational philosophy and then say, well, but I don't know if I'm right. Okay, then do, not, I know, I know for absolute certainty if, that I'm right. And if, I know for absolute certainty that your subjective experiences are in fact subjective experiences and not anything to do with other realities or GoPros shimmering into another dimension or collective vibrations of humana humana, who cares? You are going through subjective experiences and you've gone through so many that they're displacing your sense of objective reality. So, and I don't think it's fair to put that on kids because they're not going to be on the drugs, thank what, God. What is, and so you're going to be providing the effects of brain damaged drug use on kids who aren't taking the drugs. Drug use, no science yes, it hurts your brain to continually no, mess with your sense of reality. complete bullshit. Let me ask you this, though. Let me ask you this. I, it, whether my reality is right or your reality is right, we're both fucking wrong, man. Like, like if 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 you think that you're right about something, you're wrong in thinking that you're right. Dude, it, it, you just said that my perspective was bullshit. So you just no, told no. me that I was completely wrong Your about something. Is this, is, this is, this is the brain limited. damage that I'm talking about, is that you just told me I was completely wrong about something, and then you try to hand me this crap that somehow nobody can ever be completely wrong about something. This is the kind of disordered no, thinking that can, you're experiencing. Nobody can be completely sure about anything. Not You just said what I said was bullshit. Yeah, it is, though. <laughs> That's why I said Okay, it. so you're absolutely sure that you can't be absolutely sure about anything. And you're absolutely sure that I'm wrong, but nobody can ever be right or wrong about anything. This is the disordered thinking that I'm talking well, about. Well, let's go back to my original point, which is that you and me are perceiving 1% of the electromagnetic spectrum. So why is our 1% the reality, the real thing that's going on when we're not perceiving 99% of the rest of it? Why is it real? The fact that you don't know everything doesn't mean that what you know is invalid, right? So when I was a kid, I studied my times table, right? I went from 1 times 1 to 12 times 12 is 144. I learned my times tables. I don't think kids do that anymore, but that's what I learned when I was a kid. Now, does that mean I know every possible mathematical combination? Of course not. I know my times table. The fact that I don't know every possible mathematical combination does not mean that the times table is purely subjective and it's completely wrong because I don't know all the math in okay. the known so universe. So I, I, I'll, I'll recant what I said then, and I'll say that you knowing your times tables or you knowing what you know about this version of reality is true. I think that the reason why I listen to you is because I really respect your opinion and you're well-researched and you give great points on what you talk about. And I 
I, I think that you challenge a lot of topics that a lot of people aren't challenging and you present information in such a way that it, it's, it, it is irrefutable to a certain extent. But that is only one version of reality that you, your perceptions are based off of. And if if you think that I'm wrong, if you think that I'm making this up, that I'm completely de delusional, I would ask you to take 10 minutes of the, out of your life and smoke dimethyltryptamine and say that you disagree with me afterwards. Put <laughs> that is money, absolutely put your never, ever your going to happen. And listen, Stefan, you no, no, listen, that, you're, you're, you're telling me where you're, your mouth is and... and and no, you, you're telling me to do something that is illegal. You're telling me to do something that is going to harm me. You're telling me to hurt this delicate, amazing machinery of my brain so that I'll agree with you. I don't want to damage my brain so that I'll agree with you. That is not the point of philosophy. It's like saying, hey, if you want to be a really great pianist, take a sledgehammer and make a fist and pound the sledgehammer into your fist until it's broken, and then you'll be a great pianist. It's like, no, that's not how you become a great pianist. You become a great thinker by reasoning, by subjecting yourself to the objective standards of evidence and empiricism and rationality. You don't just harm your brain by causing waking delusions and think you're getting to the truth. Who's your favorite philosopher? Um, depends on my day, depends what I'm studying, depends the topic. I mean, Do you it's like Plato? Are you into Plato or Socrates or any of those Greek motherfuckers? Um, of, of the Greeks, I would say Aristotle is my favorite. Aristotle doing drugs, damaged his brain by doing psychedelic plants, damaged it. No, he didn't. He it gave him a different Wait, view. Wait, how do you know that? Uh, how do you know Aristotle did? Because all of them went to the Eleusinian mystery schools. It was a, it was a part of their culture that every person inside of the culture got to go to it. And him and Socrates and fucking Plato and all those motherfuckers were taking LSD, and that's how they gained. Philo that's where philosophy started in the white man world, essentially, was once we got back to these tribal situations. I want to say something, though. Oh, and, and listen, uh, and I, Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand took speed for decades. Exactly. And, and it was and terrible. It, it, made her. Her it, it made her paranoid. It made her vicious, highly aggressive, uh, and it killed her creativity. Well, I'm, I'm, I don't want to compare speed to a natural plant, especially an endogenous hallucinogen that's being produced in your body as we speak but speed is not that yeah okay and and look i mean so i don't i just did a whole life of aristotle i, I didn't hear anything about him doing drugs but let's say he did okay well then he took some drugs but that didn't make him a better philosopher if, if anything it harmed his yes, philosophy it to did. the point where, excuse me still me? talking still talking so it harmed his philosophy to the point where Aristotle would have made fundamental errors like defending something like slavery uh, or religiosity and so on. So maybe it harmed him and kept him from getting to the rational summit of excellence in philosophy. But listen, I, I get when I'm not going to be able to get through to someone. So I appreciate you letting me have this uh, harangue together. Um, sorry, go ahead. You can have the last word. Okay, You've gotten through to me more than, than you know. You've influenced my life a lot and I really respect you. Uh, there, Terence McKenna had this theory that um, as uh, monkeys came out of the treetops into the grasslands of Africa, they started looking for a new food source. And uh, one of the food sources that they found was the psychedelic mushroom that grows inside of uh, cattle dung. It, it grows out of the cattle dung. And this is why all of the early re religions are based off of cow goddesses and and all of that stuff and there's this thing in history that nobody can account for which is called the missing link when our brain grew in a hundred thousand years more than any other organ in any other species has grown throughout history and the he he believes and science is starting to show this right now that it was the psychedelic mushroom that caused the frontal lobe, essentially what makes you a good philosopher, your ability to articulate, all of that came from early humanity's use with psychedelic plants. You can look back into history, the origins of every religion is shamanism. That's where it all started. And I think there's a resurgence in our culture bringing us back to these shamanic archetypes and shamanic views of reality that's going on right now. And you see it in 
uh, the counterculture is tattooing their skin and stretching out their ears and dancing in mosh pits around a symbolical fire. All of this stuff is happening again. And I implore you, Stefan, especially because I respect you and I think that people like you should be the ones that are doing psychedelics because it'll benefit our culture in the best way possible. Yeah, ballet dancers don't do steroids. At least this one doesn't. And look, I mean, yeah, you, we can go back. We can go back to what um, what occurred in South America thousands of years ago. Yeah, they smoked a lot of tea. They failed to progress as a civilization. Uh, they were brutal towards their children, and they regularly performed ritual sacrifices where they ripped open the rib cages of their children and held their still beating a, a, a hearts up for the gods to consume. So uh, I'm a little skeptical of the stuff that went on thousands of years ago and if you want to well, regress well, back to monkeys came, stuffing drugs up their ass that's once, one thing but i'm going to go forward with reason and evidence so thanks a lot i'm going to close that part of the call off i appreciate the call and it's no 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 i gave you i gave you the thing and now we're going to move on what is it dying off? Okay. So uh, I, I do appreciate this, but I'm going to stand firm on, on this particular issue. I think that these hallucinogens are very damaging. I think they're very dangerous. I think they're a way of bypassing emotional pain rather than dealing with it. I think it messes with your circuitry to the point where you can believe really subjective, crazy, unsubstantiated things like GoPros vanishing into other dimensions. I don't think that's kind of where we want to be uh, when it comes to moving forward in uh, human society. Uh, and uh, I think we could see all the disordered thinking and contradictions that were occurring. But nonetheless, it was a very interesting conversation and I appreciate it. I wish that there were more people in these people's lives who could push back on some of these torrents of irrationalities that come out of these addictions. But um, I guess I'll have to step in where, where, where I can. Thanks everyone so, so much for listening. Freedomainradio.com slash donate uh, to help out these kinds of conversations that help so many tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people or millions of people over time across the world. Freedomainradio.com slash donate. FDRURL.com slash Amazon. You know where to go if you're going to do some shopping. FDRpodcast.com for the shows. Um, please like, subscribe, and share uh, these videos so that we can get more amazing quality conversations. I mean, we're doing an extra show every single week now. Uh, we're doing Tuesday uh, shows from 11 till two or even three sometimes. Uh, so we need resources for that. That's more bandwidth. That's more time, more effort, more work. And um, I really, really hope that you'll help us out at freedomainradio.com. Thanks everyone so much for calling in. I look forward to the next show as always. I'll talk to you soon.